Well, here we are, February the 7th, and that's, gosh, that's hard to believe. Uh, but that's also a reminder that next week, next Sunday, is February the 14th. So if you haven't taken the opportunity to, to get a valentine for somebody that's special that you need to get, to get a valentine for, uh, you might think that you've only got seven days left to do that. And I'll give you a hint. The dollar store has two cards for a dollar. So you can buy one card for Valentine's this year, and you can buy another card and just put it away so you've got a Valentine's card for next year. But great opportunity, just, just don't miss it. Um, today's lesson is a great lesson. It's a great lesson because on the surface we read this passage and we go, well, gosh, I do that. I, I'm, I, I, I'm impartial to people. I'm fair to people. The, the lesson comes from our quarterly, and it got my attention right away, i got to admit, that when I first opened up the quarterly and I said, we're going to be talking about this week, and the, the title of the lesson is Dealing with One Another. And as I said, we do that. We do that. It, it, the purpose statement is to commit to treating others fairly and impartially. And golly, I always do that. I always want to treat people like I want to be treated. And yet, when we read this lesson and we spend a few minutes just reflecting on it, I, I think that, that we kind of start, when we're honest with ourselves, and I always say we have to be honest with ourselves, we maybe haven't been as fair and haven't been as impartial as maybe we could have been. And we start thinking about times that maybe we fell short. And yet the message from James is a very direct message. It's a harsh message. It's a message that if it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, it certainly should. Uh, James is very direct uh, when he wrote this. And, and, and in, we start out in, in chapter 2 for this week. We're going to stay in James for next week also. And the title of this passage in your Bible is Don't Show Favoritism. And it says, my brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, here is an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person you say, stand over there, or have a seat at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin, and by that same law you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all of the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery but do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way, then speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. Now that's pretty harsh. I mean, let's admit it. I mean, we, we go through life and we think about, yeah, I'm good to people, I'm kind to people, I do things for other people. I treat people the way I want to be treated. And I appreciate it when people treat me well, when people are nice to me. And so I, 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 I'm okay. But then when we really start thinking about it, we really think what this passage says, this message is a very strong message. I'm going to tell you a story, and, and I think about this. I think about this story a lot. Um, it goes back to, to Judy and I, uh, my days in Wilmington. And we were members of a church there, and we had a Sunday school class much like we've got now. And it, it got to be a fairly large class. And we were always looking for things to do. And, and I use the term often when I think about the, the Great Commission when, when Jesus tells us to go to Samaria. I think about Samaria as somewhere out of my comfort zone. People didn't want to go to Samaria. And so when, I, when I'm exposed to different things that I'm not necessarily comfortable with, I try to push myself. I try to push myself to get exposed to that. And we, in Wilmington, we had a, a homeless shelter. 
and it was four men. Uh, it housed about 45 men. And they checked in in the evenings about, I think it was six o'clock or so, maybe a little bit earlier than that, maybe five. And in the morning they had to be gone by seven and they had to take everything they owned. When they checked in, they brought their, their personal belongings with them. And when they left, they had to take their personal belongings with them. And the particular homeless shelter had, had 45 bunks, um, beds, in, and it was basically a bunkhouse. But they didn't have any food service. And so the, the word got out and, and churches came together and seven churches decided that they would provide a meal each evening for the men. And there was a, a lot that was next door, it was an open lot next door to the, to the homeless shelter, and so the churches would bring food. And we were told, uh, you know, we talked about it. We talked about it as a, as a Sunday school class, and we said, let's take a night. And so we, we picked a night, as I, as I remember, it was on a Thursday night, and we said, we're going to take food. And, and we asked the question, well, what are we supposed to take? What, what do people typically do? And uh, we were told, well, you know, a lot of churches just, you know, bring sandwiches in a bag, a bag of potato chips, that sort of thing, and a drink, um, you know, water or maybe a soda or whatever. And, and we got to talking about it. We happened to have a chef in our class, and he owned a restaurant in Wilmington, and he said, well, I can do better than that. He said, I'll bring a, a, a stove, like a camp stove, and he said, we'll serve a hot meal. And he said, we can make soup, we can, we can have other things that, that, you know, we can make hot sandwiches whatever, but, but let's do a hot meal for, for the men. And so we did that, and we became very popular. We set up a tent in that open space, and it got so popular that, that we even had people from the neighborhood come one enough they could share in the meal. It, it was just a wonderful thing. And we got to know those men. We got to know those men well. And, and we got to know their names, and, and we you know, saw that when we would get, be getting uh, set up for that evening, we'd see them come from their jobs. A lot of them had jobs. They were day laborers. They went to a local place and, and they were painters and sheetrock and, and, and did other landscapers, did other jobs. But, but we would see them come back from their jobs. Some of them had cars. But, but we got to know them and we got to talking to them a little bit. And I think it's important that, that, that when you're in a situation like that, people want to know that you know who they are. And they like to be called by their name. Well, one Christmas, uh, we've been doing this for a while, and, and at Christmas that year we said, you know what, as a Sunday school class, let's don't have a, a Christmas party for the class this year. Let's, let's have a party for the men at the, at the shelter. And so we talked about it. We, we planned a menu. We, we set up tables. We had a, a, a big room like the Family Life Center. We set up tables. Uh, we put white uh, tablecloths on them. We, we got out the china, the silverware. We had a gift bag that we had made up for all of the men. And uh, we, we had Christmas carols. And, and it was just it was a wonderful time. And one of the things that we did was we made sure that there was a class member, at least one class member, at every table. So you got to know, know these folks. You got to know a little bit about them. Uh, I'll never forget that, that one of the men, and, and I've been thinking about him ever since, um, said that, you know, we we're talking a little bit about, about, you know, the situation that he was in, and he said, you know, I had not ever planned on living in a homeless shelter. He said, I made a mistake, and he, was in, he said, I was incarcerated for a while. And I did my time, and I got out, I've got a wife and a daughter, and I got a job. But then there was financial restitution that I needed to pay. And he said, so as soon as I got my job, they started garnishing my wages. And so I moved to the, the homeless shelter, so basically I'm living undercover. And I don't have the same job that I had before, so I can make money and send to my wife and daughter. And I thought, what a, what a tragedy that is. We haven't had an attorney in the class that we, we referred him to, and, and turns out he got that worked out because it, it just it didn't seem fair. But, but the other thing that struck us was the number of men that, that, I mean, there were tears in our eyes. We were seeing Christmas carols. I said, we haven't done this since we were children. We haven't sat around a table like this with, in this kind of an atmosphere. And we remember when we used to do that with, with our parents or at home with, and, and how mom would cook for us. And these are older men that are, that are sharing these stories. Well, it was wonderful. It was wonderful, and we, we all, we talked about it, we, we, we talked about it for weeks after that in Sunday school class. But what I wanted to share is that a woman from the church who had been a longtime member of the church, and she came up to me and she said, I heard about what you did. 
And I said, yeah, what's, what, what do you mean? And she said, well, I, I you heard that the, the men of, of the, the homeless shelter, that you had them all and you had a party. And she said, that's wonderful. That's a great thing to do. That's a wonderful thing to do at, at Christmas time, but you need to be careful. And I said, oh, well, I, I said, well, you know, we're, we're not getting too too involved. We're, we're you know, we're letting, letting people that are, are more knowledgeable handle any of the, the real issues and, and that sort of thing. And But but we did want to share with them and, and have this party. And she said, no, that ain't what I meant. If you keep doing things like that and you bring them to the church, they won't want, they'll, they'll keep coming back. And I thought, really? <laughs> and when I thought about it for a second, and I had great respect for her, and I don't think she meant it in a mean, spiteful way. But she said, if you keep doing things for them, they're going to want to keep coming back. It was okay to do that one time, but they don't dress the way we do. They don't, they, they're homeless. We, we, you know, we have high church, <laughs> and, and, and they're just not going to fit here. They're, they're not going to be able to, to give. And so, you know, you don't want to get too carried away with that. It's okay once in a while. It's okay at Christmas time. And I think about that. I've not been able to get that out of my mind because I always ask myself, we know Jesus is present. We know Jesus is present here today. We know Jesus is present in, in your home. We know Jesus is present when we have a worship service. But if Jesus were actually standing in front of you and you could hear him talk, who would he look out in your congregation and say, well, you shouldn't be here. I'm sorry, but you need to get up and leave. <laughs> I think the answer is pretty obvious. And that's what this passage is talking about. We do that, though. We do it, and we don't think about it. We, we judge people without really getting to know them. Now, I understand, and I understand that there are people that have, have mental health issues. I know that people have addictions that they're struggling with. I get that, and I'm not equipped to handle those things, and I admit that. But if there's something I can do to share with somebody, to give them a bit of hope, to give them a bit of dignity, and maybe put them with somebody that can assist them, I want to be able to do it. Now the other thing, and, and, and it's, it's the same sort of situation, except if we look at it from a different perspective. Sometimes I think we get too carried away with thinking about how important we are. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do. We, we dress a certain way. We act a certain way. We, we, we have, ha, have, have a certain type of, of worship service that we like. We're comfortable with that. We navigate to that. We, we've got friends that, that appreciate the same thing. But I'm also reminded of another story. And, and I think about people. And I think about different people that I've met. I had uh, I was listening to the, the Pat McCrory show the, on uh, WBT on the radio on talk radio and he, he was he asked the question, this was a couple of days ago, and he, he was just talking about it from the standpoint of he said, Who have you ever met? And he said, I appreciate people calling in, email, and whatever. Who have you ever met that when they walked in the room, the room just stopped? Because they were that important. They were that sort of a person. They had that personality that, that everybody wanted to navigate to them and they wanted to wait and see what that person said. And I think about the number of people that I've been in the room with. I've had the opportunity to meet some very, what you would consider to be important people. And, 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 and yet, when I get to know them, many of them are just as uncomfortable in situations that we're in. And the story I wanted to tell you is when I first got involved in NASCAR, and, and, and I got involved, I'd been a, a banker for Bruton Smith, I had sponsored NASCAR teams, and I decided to, let's say, get froggy and jump in the water. And so we started our own teams, and we, we had, at one point in time, we had three NASCAR teams. And, and early on, um, as you know, if you've ever been to a NASCAR race, there's the garage area, and the garage area is off limits to anybody that's not a participant in the sport, so it's limited to to crew and to um, team owners and drivers. And, and so on the outside of the garage area, there are always people milling around. And, and the entrance to the garage area, there's always people, the fans, and they're wanting autographs, they're wanting to get to see uh, their favorite driver or, or, their, or their favorite uh, personality. 
And it's one of those things, you get that past, you start walking in there and you walk by those people, and if you're not careful, you start thinking, yeah, I'm pretty important. They want to know me. I mean, I mean, try having somebody ask you for an autograph sometime. It's a different experience. And, and one of the people that I first noticed, and I, and I was just amazed that he would do that, was Richard Petty. Now, Richard Petty, the king. Richard Petty, who got what, 200 wins, seven championships. Richard Petty. And he would drag a barrel over to the fence in the garage and would crawl up on the barrel and would fans would hand pieces of paper over the fence for him to autograph so that they'd get Richard Petty's autograph. And I was amazed at that. And I thought, wow, I mean, I'd never really spent much time with Richard. I, I, I you know, had, had been around him, but it wasn't one of those things I'd ever really had any conversation with him. And I thought, well, I, I'm impressed with the fact he would do that, but he's the king. I mean, he, he is somebody that the people emulate. They want to be able to get near him. Well, one day we were in the garage, and uh, I was looking for Judy. I couldn't find her. And I started asking a couple of people, and I said, hey, you seen Judy? You seen Judy? I haven't seen her. Well, I said, finally somebody, after I'd asked three or four people, said, oh, yeah, we saw her. She was with Richard Petty going up in his hauler. I thought, she doesn't know Richard Petty. Well, somehow or other, uh, she had, she'd, had, had gotten to know him. I mean, he knew, you know, we were in the garage and we had teams and that sort of thing. But I went up in the hauler and I said, oh, well, I've, I've been looking for you. And uh, Judy said, well, Richard's showing me his new hearing aids he got. <laughs> and he pulled them out of his ear and showed them to me. But what struck me about that was here's the king. Here's the king who's not perfect. Here's the king who admits he's not perfect. I mean, he's showing Judy his hearing aids. They were laughing about it. Here's somebody that even though he was held in great respect, he was a star, he was willing to, to meet people where they were and admit that I'm not perfect. And when I look back at myself, I said, that's an important lesson for all of us. We're not perfect. And if we're not careful, we get to thinking some days how important we are, and we're not. I'll never forget, and I quote my father often in different lessons, different things that he said over the years. I was probably 14 years old, and Jim Rhodes, governor of Ohio, came to our town, and I don't know, they were opening up something, he was a guest speaker, and, and it was a big deal, and Dad was very much involved with that. And I was in awe. I mean, here's the governor of Ohio. And I'm standing there next to him. There was a picture in the paper with me standing there next to the governor of Ohio. And Dad's comment to me, and I've never forgotten it, he said, I don't care who somebody is. I don't care how important they are. I don't care what they're elected to. I don't care how much of a star they are. They put their pants on one leg at a time when they get up in the morning. And I think about that. I think about how important that is that if we're not careful, we elevate people to a level that's unrealistic. And we're told in this passage from James, don't do it. Treat everybody equal. Don't hold somebody out to be more important than somebody else. We need to recognize that, that first of all, we're not all that important. We're equal with everybody else. We're equal with the, the poorest of the poor because God created us all in his own image. And it's true that we need to fulfill that royal law that says, love your neighbor as yourself. Never really thought much about it being a sin when I looked at somebody and I judged them. When I judged them based upon the way they dressed or the way they looked, it's hard not to do that sometimes. But we're all children of God. We need to keep understanding that. We need to share that with each other can't wait to get back together again because I, I think about all the things that we can do, all the things that we can do to make a difference, and all the things that God is asking us to do to make a difference. I love each and every one of you, and I look forward to, to that time when we can, we can talk about some of those things that we can do together again to share the message. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just we give you thanks. We, we give you thanks for these words. We give you thanks for this scripture. It's so important. And we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded on a daily basis.
that you created each and every one of us in your image, that you created each and every one of us equal to do your work. And as we go throughout this week, we continue to pray that you keep our eyes open to those things you want us to see, to those people that are marginalized, to those people that are, that are on the edge of society, that you keep our ears open to the things you want us to hear, to the messages you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing to everyone, that love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray, amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. And don't forget Valentine's. <laughs>